Hello, my name is Barbara and I'm a peer researcher from MENCAP. Um, you're all very welcome here today to find out about our research project on supported decision making. The project partners are Praxis Care, MENCAP and Queen's University, Belfast. I have enjoyed working on this project and look forward to sharing our initial findings with you today. Hello, my name is Anya and I am a peer researcher from MENCAP. I have learned a few things during my work that when people with a learning disability make their own choices, they feel good about it. I have also learned that people with a learning disability like a bit of support from support workers or parents when making big decisions. I will now hand you over to Vanilla to begin the presentation. Thank you. So today we're just going to go over the context um, of our research project. What is supported decision making? What is the research issue at hand? Methodology of our research, our findings from the interviews we conducted, our own reflections as peer researchers and implications for law, policy and practice. Making decisions about your own life is a key aspect of independence, freedom and human rights. Our current mental health law um, allows compulsory intervention even when people have the capacity to decline intervention. This discriminates against those with mental health problems and those with intellectual disabilities as it denies them the opportunity to make independent decisions. So as of May 2016, the Mental Capacity Act Northern Ireland became statute law. This is a really unique and progressive development as it will replace um, a separate mental health law rather than be in parallel. Um, what makes this act um, so unique and exciting is that it seeks to address discrimination of a separate mental health law. Um, our core principle is that people are not to be treated as unable to make a decision about their life until all practical help and support has been given without success to that person. So in regards to our research project, we explored our people may or may not have been supported to make decisions in their own life. We looked at, well, the project aimed to, um, sorry. <laughs> um, the project aimed to um, provide an overview of approaches of support, what has worked for those individuals, uh, the sort of support that people have been given in the past and what uh, support people actually prefer. The findings can therefore um, inform how the new support principle can be implemented in practice. So what is supported decision making? Supported decision making can be explained as a framework in which a person is assisted to make, is assisted so they can make valid decisions. Uh, there are different forms of support within support decision making. For example, if a per person has intellectual disabilities and they have to make a decision on using legal documents, that person can be assisted by being given uh, user accessible language in a document or they can have pictures to help them understand and make a really well informed decision regarding their own life. Uh, we're hoping that the Act will allow individuals to exercise his or her legal capacity. Uh, supported decision making uh, differs from substitute decision making or guardianship as it allows an individual to take action and have a certain level, con level of control over their own life. Um, so as previous, previously said earlier, the support principle is that we're allowing individuals to take a certain level of control um, over their own life by giving them all the practical help and support that they need to make decisions as it is a fundamental aspect of independence. So what is the research issue at hand? There are people without support that would be deemed or assessed as incapable of making decisions um, in their life. However, when these people are given support, they are fully capable of making decisions. What this means is that 
by not allowing individuals or not providing them with support, you are infringing, um, it infringes their right, it, it infringes their rights, it sort of takes away their autonomy and it reinforces their exclusion from society. In regards to law and policy, the Act will hopefully offer um, a, a comprehensive legal and policy framework. However, the big issue at hand is that there is very, very limited research evidence on disabled people's experiences to approaches to support. Uh, we don't know exactly what works for these individuals, what sort of pref uh, support they actually prefer. Um, it's very unclear and with the Act, we do need research to find out what is going to be the best support approach for these individuals. Um, we hope by 2020 or 2021 that the Mental Capacity Act will be implemented, um, but as the moment, we would really need a lot of research um, evidence to inform the code of practice and also for the wider implementation process. I'm just going to pass you on to my colleague David. Hello there. Um, as the research set out to explore people's experiences of decision making and what support they have or have not received, it was determined that a qualitative research approach consisting of semi-structured interviews was the most suitable way to address the research question. An interview schedule was co-developed by the Queen's researchers, peer researchers and an international advisory panel and 41 semi-structured interviews were conducted with individuals with uh, mental health problems and or learning disabilities and who were service users of either Praxis Care or MENCAP. The interviews were conducted jointly um, by two members of the research team, led by a peer researcher and supported by a member of the Queen's research team or Praxis and MENCAP. And these interviews were conducted between November 2017 and January of this year. The analytical strategy for the study is that of framework analysis, which provides a structured approach to the analysis of qualitative data um, and follows five steps. Framework analysis was chosen for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is flexible, uh, rigorous and systematic and offers clarity, transparency and an audit trail, which is important um, for the validity and reliability of qualitative research. Secondly, it's very suitable in situations where there is a team of researchers um, working, as in the case of this study where I think there are 11 of us. It's also very useful in supporting individuals who are new to qualitative research, as it provides a very clear structure and process for them to follow. And the five steps on screen. So it starts off with familiarization, or just immersing yourself in the interview transcripts and gaining intimate knowledge of them. It then moves on to developing a thematic framework. And uh, framework analysis is flexible in that it allows themes to be identified from the literature and used to start the analysis, but it also allows for themes to be inductively uh, derived from the interview transcripts themselves as the research goes on. Indexing or coding the data will then take place in in vivo, and it will be conducted by two members of the research team who are coding independently in order to ensure the reliability of the data. We then move on to charting, which is essentially summarising data through matrices of themes and moving on to interpretation. As mentioned, Invivo will be used and this software will very easily allow the comparing and contrasting of responses from those individuals with mental health problems and those individuals with intellectual disabilities so that we can see how responses may be similar or different across both populations. As mentioned, the um, Interviews were only uh, completed in January of this year, and so this seminar is just a presentation of some of the initial themes and findings from our data. The first thing to note is that decision making is a very abstract concept, and so when talking to people about decisions, applied examples are very important. In terms of how people make decisions and their experiences of decisions, there is a wide variety in the responses from our participants. This ranged from individuals who had in the past had decisions made on their behalf but now make decisions themselves to those individuals who struggled somewhat with decisions and required that decisions be presented to them in a certain format in order to enable them to make a decision and right at the other end of the continuum 
um, people who avoided decision making and just put off having to make decisions. There is also clear from the transcripts that there was some fear over decision making, both amb ambiguity over the decision making process and what steps to follow, but also concern over what the outcome of decisions may be, and this caused some people um, concern and struggle with decisions. Also, when decisions were presented to people in a format that um, they were not familiar with or not used to, that also impacted on their ability to make a decision. But one recurrent theme from the interview transcripts was that of time, and how time and being put under time pressure or on the spot um, was a real inhibitor to making decisions, as people needed time to be able to review the alternatives, reflect on it, and then make a decision. When asked about people's experiences and the emotions that they felt in the past when decisions had been made on their behalf, there was again quite a lot of variability in responses. This ranged from those who sought independence and who were quite angry that decisions had been made on their behalf, to those at the other end of the spectrum who were quite happy to have decisions made for them as they saw this as evidence that people were supporting them and trying to help them. But another thing that was clear from our interviews was the distinction between the process of decision making and the outcome of a decision. And quite often the outcome of a decision would affect a person's perception of the process and the valency of the decision. So if it had, had an outcome that they weren't maybe intending or weren't happy with, that would affect how they viewed the process. And certainly with some of the people I spoke to, it affected their confidence in making further decisions in the future. In terms of what people found helpful in order to make decisions, um, time, as mentioned, was a key factor. Giving people time to evaluate the information, to reflect on it, to talk about it with other people if they wished, and then make a decision that they could be comfortable with and not rushed. Um, another key thing was that of support offered by the family, and the family came up as quite an important unit in decision making. Um, Moreover, the trust and relationship that one had with their service provider, family member or supporter and how good and strong that relationship was and how happy a person was that they felt the other person did have their interests at heart, that trust and relationship was very important to facilitating decision making and making decisions that people were happy with. Um, the information that is supplied to people when making decisions is also vitally important and ensuring that the information is provided in a format that is accessible and suitable to the individual, whether that is in written or verbal form. And so the onus here is on care providers or people who are supporting um, individuals making decisions to ensure that they have information that is accessible to the format the person requires and allows them to be familiar with the decision making process. So this is going to require some flexibility and tailoring an approach to each individual rather than assuming that a one-size-fits-all approach will work. Sorry. In terms of how the peer research process worked, um, it started off with the Queen's um, researchers providing training to us as peer researchers on research methodology, the conduct of interviews and also self-care when we were conducting the interviews and um, moving on through the project. Data collection, as mentioned, was carried out as a team led by a peer researcher and supported by a member of the research team. And moving on to the data analysis, that is also being conducted as a whole team. Um, I think it's fair to say there's been no tokenism in terms of peer researchers in this project, that we have actually been involved in every decision that has been made about the research and to an, we remain to be involved in it to an ongoing extent. <coughs> Our plans for dissemination include this seminar and other outputs and uh, publications. And um, the future plans immediately are to finish the analysis of the data. We're then going to present our findings back to the individuals who participate in the interviews in order to get a discussion with them and some feedback in order to increase the validity and reliability of our findings. Finally, it is hoped that the research and its associated report will help to inform the current drafting of the Mental Capacity Act 2016 and also to inform the National Institute of Clinical Excellence's draft guidelines on decision making and mental capacity. And we also hope that the research contributes to better understanding of what support works for people when it comes to support decision making.
Thank you very much for listening.